Hello and welcome to the swim brief. Katie Hoff, Anderson, Todd, Anderson. Uh, so thrilled to have both of you guys. Um, as I just said offline, uh, this is swimming podcast. So hopefully you know who Katie Hoff is. If you don't, uh, Google it, you know, and, and figure that part <laughs> out and uh, see what you can come up with because you should know. Um, anybody that's that's a fan, uh, incredible athletic career. Um, Todd, you may be less familiar to uh, a swimming audience, but I want people to sort of get to know who you are. So give us a little bit of, uh, uh, give us the sports biography of Todd Anderson. Yeah, so I, uh, I grew up playing three sports in high school and uh, I ended up walking out in Michigan State, Michigan State football player. So I went in as a walk-on, I ended up starting there and kind of that was where my passion for strength conditioning came in. Um, after that, I had like a, a short time in the St. Louis Rams. Um, and that's where I met Katie. Um, so after that, it was easy transition out of the, you know, the sports world into the strength conditioning world where I started training some athletes. Um, I started working with Equinox and I've worked with them for quite a long time. I don't work with them anymore, but um, really became passionate about, you know, human performance, the human body, sleep, nutrition, and kind of, you know, using all these different tools to, to make people better and optimize performance. Yeah, I think it's really exciting what you're doing. Uh, like, I, I feel like I need to, you know, uh, book some time with you out of this because I, I'm a very poor sleeper. Um, and at various points in my own athletic pursuits, um, I've become obsessive about sleep because I, I, I know that it's really important for recovery, but uh, I'm guessing that obsessing over sleep is, is not the best way to enhance uh, the sleep part of your training. Yeah, that's one of the worst things you can do. <laughs> Actually, you know, what's funny is obsessing over sleep when people used to count sheep, you know, like yeah. that's a form of obsessing over sleep because you're so dialed in. You actually fall asleep slower if you count sheep than if, than if you don't count sheep. So that's just one form Fun of fact. Fun fact. Do Oh, hold on. I just got a weighted blanket. Do weighted blankets work? Those are actually good. Those have been shown to work. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah, I've been sleeping with it for a week. It's been... Uh, sleeping with been... socks is a good thing, too. Sleeping on my side? No, sleeping with socks on. Oh, no. My Which wife's not going to like that. People are, like, really <laughs> shook about that. Yeah, I was like, yeah. no. <laughs> I might get divorced if I, if I slept with my socks on. <laughs> I guess if I put a clean pair of socks on, like, I'd have yeah, to change my that. socks. Oh, well, obviously. I mean, I don't know. I'm just getting new, to, you know, used to this uh, socks thing. But okay, back to you, Todd. Um, <laughs> okay. uh, you know, you had this uh, this athletic career where, um, you know, you you ended up playing at a high Division One level, made it all the way um, to the pros, and as you said, you ended up going down this uh, strength and conditioning path. After that, um, was there a point uh, at which, you know, you sort of decided uh, to go one way or another? You know, could you have pursued professional football more and, and just made a decision to move on with it? Or tell me a little bit more about that. I think um, I think I definitely, well, at first, I think I, I overachieved for sure to get to the NFL. That was... Um, I, I, I maximized my potential for sure. I, uh, I, I reamed it for all it was worth. And um, I think because of that, I knew I had a pretty good perspective of what my talent level was, what my physical capabilities were, the way the NFL offenses were going. I mean, I was an old school fullback and, and you know, the evolution of the game did not help me. Right. So, you know, as I, I got into the NFL, and was released. I, I got hurt. You know, I had a couple of knee surgeries, a hand surgery. I, I pulled my, I tore my quad, pulled my hamstring. You know, things kind of started to unravel a little bit. And I just had met Katie and it just kind of felt right to walk away. I felt very content with, you know, I didn't really want to do the free agency lifestyle where you're, you might get signed for a couple of weeks, get released, you know, keep training, you know, maybe get signed for three or four more weeks. Maybe you make a roster eventually. You just don't really know what's going to happen. So, you know, that's when, you know, I decided to move down to Naples and moved in with Katie right away. And <laughs> it just seemed like the, um, the right choice at the time. And the other thing was, is I honestly was very passionate about strength conditioning. 
And I was pretty eager to jump into that field. I, I was always more interested in our training outside of the field than on the field. Um, so as, as far as my passion goes, that, that was a no brainer for me. Yeah. So there was always, even, even when you were still an athlete, there was a part of you that was thinking about yeah. future coaching and, and helping yeah. people in, in this field. Even, um, I mean, coach D'Antonio, my college coach was mad at me. So like I, I had seven credits left to get my degree and I decided to have my agent, he paid for me to go down and train for four months. And my thought process was like, I want to do this for a living. This would be a great internship. I'm going to learn so much. I get to work out three times a day. All my meals are paid for. You know, I have some of the best resources as far as, as training goes. Like, why would I not take advantage of that? Well, right. so, so I think, um, I think that I saw so many smart people and so much great knowledge being used, but sometimes I think it's hard not to take a step back and conceptually look at how can we piece these things together to make a system that maybe, you know, you don't have definitive research, but it makes a lot of sense when you take each piece individually. Yeah, and that's, kind that's, of that's coaching, isn't it? Right. Yeah, I mean, sure. that, that, that's a thing is like you, you, of course you want to be evidence-based and it's, it's really good to, have scientific resources for what you're doing. But at some point you like it in my line of work, you, you got to step on the pool deck and deliver yeah. something and, and your kids aren't science projects. Right. <laughs> yeah. right. Absolutely. Um, you know, they, they, uh, you can't just like feed. Um, and I think, you know, there's a temptation, especially in a sport like swimming where there's, where there's times everywhere. It's just so easy to measure so many things where you just want to like, you do want it to be a math problem where you just feed some numbers yeah. at one end and you get the results out the other end. Now, when did it'd be a lot easier, it'd be way did, easier. <laughs> when did the two of you meet? Um, yeah, so we met, uh, I was training for my NFL pro day okay. and she was training for 2012 at the time in Naples, Trials, Florida. Yeah. yeah. So we had a similar, our strength conditioning coach was like the same guy. Oh, so yeah. Right, so you guys met so, over that. We met over that. He's going to get it all. So I was already talking to someone and I met him at the same time and ended up not being a great guy. And uh, we kept in touch and just had a friendship. And I went into 2012 trials and he was like, hey, can you send me, you know, a swim USA swimming t-shirt sponsored by Speedo? not knowing like he's at this point was like XXL, like XXXL. I had to like, you know, <laughs> special order delivery for him. I didn't have the swimming physique. No. Sure. <laughs> and so um, sent him that and it was just like very, very supportive. I had a rough trials and just really headed off. Like both of us were going through some tough times and some, some transitions in that year. And I mean, right away, just kind of saw very similar values and drive and belief in each other. And um I think started dating like three months after trials, um, moved in together like two months after that and the rest is history. So. Yeah. I moved in with my wife, I think after, uh, three months of dating. Yeah. yeah when you know, you know, decision, right? right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, uh, it's bring up something interesting there, Katie, in, in terms of, um, and I'll bring it back to, uh, Todd here for a second. Um, you know, you, you started your bio, you said you were a walk on at Michigan state. Um, you ended up being a, a scholarship player. And by the way, I do know that you were XXXXL because I, <laughs> I looked up a ca uh, combine uh, profile for you today. And the one thing they had on there is a great size. Yeah. <laughs> like, you're a very big, you play fullback, right? Yeah, fullback. Yeah. Yeah, I was a big fullback. I was a little, probably a little too heavy for fullback, but our uh, offense was just rammed it down people's throats. So, but did you, I mean, Katie kind of hinted at it. Uh, were you really disappointed that you didn't end up uh, with a sort of a longer pro career? Because somebody might listen to it and say, wow, I mean, I would get, if I was a walk on, like I'd be thrilled just to get a shot at something. But, you know, as it got closer and you got to a higher and higher level, were you thinking like, I can do this, you know, and this, this is something for me? Yeah. I mean, honestly, it, it wasn't in my mind until halfway through my senior season. You know, so um, I think that's how I got passionate about conditioning is I think off the field stuff, I saw how big of an impact putting in that extra work in can actually progress you. But yeah, I mean, it was kind of a double-edged sword. You know, I, I got I got to that point and I was like really excited and that was my dream. You know, and I, and I you know, I signed with the team 
And um, meeting Katie had something to do with that, but you know, I was pretty banged up. I had knee injury, I, I tore my quad, all this stuff. And when I got released, it, it kind of felt okay to be done. You know, I played fullback. The position was kind of getting eliminated. I kind of like made it to my dream. Um, you know, I knew I was never going to be an elite player in the NFL. It's just there's, I was not a gifted athlete uh, to that caliber. And uh, I, you know, I had peace with it. Like it felt, it felt pretty good at the time. And uh, I think I made the right decision because I could have probably, you know, trying to be a free agent, bounce around to some teams, but that's a tough life. You know, you might be squeaked. Yeah. Yeah. It might be two weeks with one team, a couple weeks with another. You don't know where you're going to live. And just meeting her and, and feeling good about, you know, walking away at the, at the place I was at, um, I think I made the right decision. And now he can walk when he's 50 and we have Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, my, my oldest friend in the world, he, he, he played Division three college football. But I remember at some point, uh, even at that level, you know, he said his doctor looked at him and said, like, do you want to pick your kids up? Yeah. When, when you're, when they're five years old, like, yeah. And, um, that was a real sort of jolt to his system. I know that, that, um, that stuff is, is, is definitely real. I want to switch bases because, uh, Katie, you've got a new book out. Um, well, yeah. I mean, a new book out, you've got your first book as far as first I can tell book. Yeah. out. And, um, you know, I read, uh, the prologue that was published in, uh, on swim swam. And you take people to the right away to the 2008 Olympics. You're swimming the 400 freestyle, um, and you finish that race. Um, you're, uh, I can guess from reading it, you're pretty disappointed with what's going on. Why did you choose to start there in in writing this book? Yeah, it's a great question. I think you know the process of writing the book was was really cool cathartic all these things um but i think it the way we started was like okay what what was the most pivotal and impactful moment in your career and every single time i went back to that moment um just because you know the difference between winning and being able to say your gold medal the ultimate goal all these things and, and how i look back on my career how i look back on beijing and so I think, you know, it just kind of emerged just organically uh, between my ghostwriter and I when we were, you know, when I talked about it um, and then I never forget, he, you know, sent it back to me and I was like, this is the, pro like, this is the prologue um, because it just shaped so much of what happens after that um, into my adult life, um, you know, so, so many things in my, in my career. Um, and so I just felt like it made the most sense. It's also kind of like a, a little bit of a cliffhanger, like, is it good? Is it bad? I don't know. Keep reading. Um, so I think it, it kind of did its job in many ways. Definitely. I mean, for somebody who's a swimming fan, right? I mean, we, we, we I have a memory of watching that race. I mean, and you say in there that it's, it's uh, been really hard for you to watch it over again. Um, I haven't watched it over again. You haven't. You've never seen that race again. So I only saw it. Uh, I also saw the last five meters uh, when they replayed it uh, right before Schmidt's Alison Schmidt's race in uh, London. So I was watching it to support wow. her, and this popped up, and I was like, "Fantastic!" <laughs> so um, that's the only last ten meters is the, or five to ten meters is all I've ever seen of the race. No, that's. I mean. It's not a fun five or ten. Yeah, no, so. it's not a fun five. It's like the worst <laughs> five or ten meters. But it's yeah, you want to relive? No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, I actually talk about that experience in the book of like, kind of not being prepared to see that, and like being at a friend's house, like really just kind of forcing myself to watch the London Games because you know Alison Schmidt and Elizabeth Eisler were two of my best friends, and being like, oh, I want to watch them to support them. Uh, and that popping up and being like, whoa, and just kind of breaking down. So this wasn't, still wasn't okay in that piece with that moment. So um, yeah, I get, I get pretty, pretty raw and pretty vulnerable with, you know, the tough moments and, you know, really amp up the great moments. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, very proud of the way that it kind of all came out. And why did you decide to write the book? So so I waited, you know, a lot of people have asked me like, why do you, you know, you're five years removed from retiring. Um, I think it was just, I, I was ready. You know, I, I wasn't for the longest time and he can attest to this. It was just like, you know, I tried to write stuff down. I got too emotional. I didn't know how to really frame my story in a, a positive yet real way. Uh, and I think it was just 
one, I needed to do it to heal and to be able to frame my career and my story in a way that I felt really good about and really proud about. And I needed to face some stuff and some demons in my career that I, I hadn't faced that I just run away from. Um, and I wanted it to be a story to inspire younger athletes or, you know, anyone who goes through the ups and downs of creating a success story or a blueprint in their own life. And um, that's kind of what I started. I was like, I want to do that, but how, but how, but how? And, and I finally was connected with the right person who was able to, like he says, capture my voice better than I could have captured it. Um, I tried so many different times to write it and it was almost like I needed a coach, like I needed a coach in the rest of my life. I needed a coach to help me, you know, really be able to put uh, my words and my thoughts and my journey to paper. And it just kind of all happened at the right time, at the perfect time. And um, just, just worked out really, really well. Yeah. And you referenced in there a little bit, you know, like uh, who this book is for, but I mean, what's the, when you were writing this and of course you're writing some really deeply, as you say, deeply personal, vulnerable um, stuff, but you know, you think this could help somebody else if they read this. I mean, so who is the, who are the people out here who this is going to be, if we're looking at like a holiday season, you know, Christmas is yeah. 13 days away. Like who's this book for? I think any, I mean, honestly, anyone who has a goal or has a dream of, you know, accomplishing something extraordinary, something great. And I think that's anyone. Um, I think some people um, just naturally have this big goal and it's there and they're chasing it. But I think there's other people that, you know, it's in them, but they just need a little bit of extra kick or extra motivation. Um, you know, I also really, really want it to be for, you know, athletes or coaches that um, think that I, you know, I think when I looked at Olympians when I was younger, I just painted them on this pedestal, pedestal that like, they don't go through all the, you know, crazy emotions, they don't get nervous, they don't, um, you know, really get upset in, in, you know, hard times. And I paint that picture and I want people to know that that's a the struggle is a part of the path to get to greatness, to get to your extraordinary goal. And I hope that it allows people to feel confident, like, okay, maybe I break down at practice today. Maybe I cry. Maybe I get super nervous. That's okay. Cause every single person goes through that. Every single person who accomplishes anything great goes through that. So it's okay. Just keep plugging along. Just keep being relentless and just keep fighting for the goal. If it's something that means that much to you. And in the book, I mean, I, I, obviously I can gather that a good part of it is about your own uh, journey to international success in swimming. Um, and was there a moment where you, where that became the goal? Like when you, you, you describe this prologue, that heartbreak of, of not winning a, a gold medal when um, in many ways you were, you were favored to win some, but what was the moment where that became a goal or was it or was it ever a goal yeah there were two moments the first moment when I wanted to be an Olympian I was sitting in Virginia Beach watching the 2000 Olympics and I watched Caitlin Sandino who was 17 at the time swim and I was like oh my gosh she's 17 like I just need to be an Olympian so I was 11 there and then the next time where I was like well I don't just be an Olympian I want to break world records, I won Olympic, win Olympic gold medals was when I watched Natalie Coughlin, which is so weird. Both of these two amazing women were teammates of mine in 2004 and 2008. Um, but I watched Natalie go under the, a minute in the 100 back, meter backstroke at Fort Lauderdale 2002 nationals, my first nationals as a 12 year old. And I watched her, I watched her break the world record and I was like in awe, but it was like this moment where I was like, I want to do that too. Like that's, that seems so amazing. And I, ignorance is bliss. I had no idea what goes into breaking a world record, but I was very, very inspired to want to do the same thing. As you said, you, 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 I mean, I can, I can guess a couple of people that you grew up idolizing were Natalie and Caitlin. You say it's weird, you know, that you eventually end up with them as uh, teammates. Teammates and rivals. Teammates and rivals, <laughs> right? You had to, you, you were, literally racing uh Caitlin Sandino pretty much every time though you guys had the same best event 
uh, mm -hmm. you could say. Yeah. Um, what did you, what changed from when you were sort of idolizing them, as you said, like you're thinking like, you know, this person's so impressive, this person never gets scared, you know, they're always ready to go. And um, what, wh was there a moment where you sort of noticed, like picked up on, yeah, actually these are human beings, um, just like me and uh, sort of started to think about yourself differently as well? Yeah, it's a really good question. I don't know if it was much my view of them. It was just like, you know, the, the process from 2003 to 2004, I dropped a ton of time. Like I just, yes. you know, I went from, I remember I raced Caitlin a year out from 04 and I got fourth and I think she'd be like four seconds in a 200. Um, it was just my process. Like I just kept steadily building momentum in practice. Each meet, I kept dropping a couple extra seconds. Um, and then by the time I was coming up to trials, it was just kind of like, I was laser focused on what I was doing. And it was kind of like, if I beat you, then I beat you. But like, I'm focused on like where I'm at with my progress. And it just kind of then just all happened. Um, and I think that's part of why my 2004 games, everything just happened so quickly. I was like almost not aware of what was happening until I got to the Athens Olympic games. And I was like, oh my God, <laughs> like, I am, I'm swimming with these people that were my idols, Jenny Thompson and, and all that. So um, I think it was just a combination of like process, but also kind of being ignorance is bliss for a little bit which only lasts you so long <laughs> until it runs out and you open your eyes and you're like, okay, I don't have the full confidence for this quite yet. Yeah. I, um, okay. One, one last question. And then I want to get to the project that you guys <laughs> are doing together. And then at the end, I have a lightning round of questions that I think. Oh, really <laughs> um, as a, as a coach, you know, when I, when I look at the history and I've written about this, um, so I'm a huge swimming fan, swimming nerd, love, love watching um, high caliber swimming. Um, it, it strikes me that we've entered this era where um, people have very long competitive careers. Mm -hmm. um, but I look at somebody like Missy Franklin is, is retired from swimming. You're, you're retired. I'm not, I'm not saying the situations are the same, but um, Dagny Knutson retired um, and still at an age where there's people like her age who could be competing. Is there a lesson there for coaches? Do we need to change something about the way we're coaching? Are there, are there advice you would give to somebody who has uh, a 15 year old who's just truly exceptional on their team um, that's, you know, shooting for or maybe they've qualified for Olympic trials and they're, they're sort of on the steep upward curve. What would you say to them? Yeah, I think that was kind of what I was getting at too with the book. I think I definitely delve into the coach summer relationship, but that's a very interesting question because the three people you just gave examples of were all, you know, Missy's was, if Missy's shoulder wasn't ripped <laughs> to everything, she'd still be swimming. If I didn't have blood clots, I, I guarantee you I'd still be swimming. You know, Dagny's, I'm not as, as familiar with her situation, but I think it's not as much like if you have someone at that level, like I, I was always driving myself, you know, it didn't matter. Like my coach was kind of just always the support and I was in the driver's seat. Um, and I know Missy pretty well, like very similar. Yeah. I would say the best advice I can give is you want an athlete who retires and looks back on their career in a very, very positive light. And I think a lot of times the burnout happens, like an athlete keeps going, but then they don't want to look at a pool again. <laughs> like, I don't want to get in a pool. And I think that there's ways to preserve enjoying the process better because, you know, a lot of times, like the reason I made my comeback for 2016 before I got the blood class was I wanted to actually go and enjoy the Olympic games and look around and be like, wow, like I am swimming for Team USA and this is really cool. And I think sometimes younger athletes get caught up in this like next thing, next thing, next thing. And they don't, and, and the coach is young too, and they're, they're doing the same thing, but sometimes like allow that athlete to slow down for just a split second and enjoy the process and understand that perspective. Because at 15 years old, you don't have the perspective 
typically to be able to enjoy that. <laughs> like I didn't. Katie Ledecky may have, but <laughs> she's she's another another uh, crazy amazing human being. But um, that would be my advice. Try to just help them gain that perspective. Okay. All right. So I want to talk about this uh, project you're doing together, and and part of this is you know uh, um, this podcast is sponsored by Jersey Wahoo's, my employer. <laughs> Yeah, sweatshirt I'm wearing and the video version that people will see of this. Um, and you guys are, are working with us. Um, uh, but back it up a little bit. Uh, explain to people what Synergy Dryland is and what you guys uh, provide in terms of services. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, Synergy Dryland in general, you know, it came about from actually me training Katie for like the 2016, uh, I guess her, her, her lead up to, to the 2016 Olympics, right? Trying to get back into it in her comeback. And, you know, I think that being on the strength conditioning side for other sports and general fitness and wellness, you know, there's a ton of innovation on that side. It evolves faster probably than any other industry, but, you know, it takes a long time for coaches and everybody to kind of get bought into some of these techniques. So, you know, when I started training her, we took a little bit of a different approach. You know, I think the perspective was a little different just naturally because of our backgrounds. And, you know, we were able to come up with something that worked really well for Katie and was probably a little, um, you know, off the beaten path, I would say for a normal swim workout or swim strength conditioning program. Um, so that kind of, you know, fell by the wayside. We continued, um, you know, following the sport. And I started to get more and more interested in strength conditioning of swimming specifically after learning more about it to train her. You became uh, obsessed. Yeah. I mean, I, I was pretty, <laughs> I was you went pretty down the rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I got my hands on anything I could read about swimming strength conditioning. And, um, you know, it just seemed like there was a lot of opportunities to take some of like the innovation that's a rapidly moving health and wellness industry. Yeah. Some of the science from strength conditioning and then some of the swim specific stuff that coaches have been doing for a long time and kind of combined it. So we decided, well, why don't we provide this? You know, you look at swim coaches and this is how it came about. You look at swim coaches and they're so good at coaching swimming. I mean, some of the technique stuff that we see online and we've, we've talked to different coaches, it's amazing the detail that these guys can break stuff down to do. And um, I'm blown away, but at the same, on the same uh, sense, it's like, you can't expect someone to be that big of an expert in coaching swimming and then also in strength conditioning. Yeah. That's just, I mean, I've never seen anyone. Like no do other that. sport does that. You know, yeah, like, Here's where I am with, with uh, strength and conditioning and dry land, all that stuff. I feel like I know enough to know all the stuff I don't know. <laughs> I'm almost like the reason that's I. That's a serious place to be. <laughs> <laughs> The re that's the reason why I think it's a really great thing you guys are doing because when I get to the point of actually trying to uh, come up with dry land programming, I'm paralyzed because I can think of so many things that are not a good idea <laughs> that I've learned at some point, like, ooh, that's not good, that's not good. So I just sit there going like, well, what am I gonna do then? Right, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, and. We're, we, you're right. We are in a really tricky spot. I think coaching, you know, knowledge so frequently it gets handed down like person to person, you know, so whatever you're, you may do um, dry land wise, or even the way you set up practices has a lot to do with the other coaches you've interacted with. Right. So um, yeah. being able to interact with somebody who has expertise in another area, um, if for nothing else is going to make you a, a a better coach just by getting some information uh, from outside of the loop. And I, I think swimming twos is really ripe for that as a sport. We tend to, um, I don't know, maybe football is the same, right? But we tend to sort of like funnel into yeah, sure. swimming knowledge sources and um, cut anything out that comes from outside. What were some things, um, uh, Katie or Todd, you guys can answer this. What were some things that you saw uh that were sort of ripe for innovation in the swimming dry land space um i mean the things that jumped out to me right away were i think just like soft tissue and mobility work in general yeah i think you know you see so many overuse injuries in the pool um and a combination with that is just looking at the shoulder the shoulder girdle the way the scapula moves that entire sequencing 
of a swimmer is often, I don't want to say ignored, but it's not addressed in a specific way, right? So swimming, the swimming stroke is extremely unique. The body is not designed, you know, we did not evolve in water, mm -hmm. right? So like yeah. our joints are not perfectly, um, you know, engineered to do a swimming stroke every day of the week. No. You know, so I think there are swimming specific stuff when you, you have to look at to have the kind of longevity people are looking for. And um, I, I don't think that's often addressed. And the other thing is, I think when you look at basic strength conditioning or swimming, you know, swimming is pretty much the only sport where gravity is thrown out the window. Yep. And every other sport is just manipulating gravity with weights and bands and all these different things. And it easily applies to their sport. Well, swimming, if, if you don't have gravity, you don't have, you know, fixed points on the ground to create these different ranges of motion and forces, you're in the water, like it's a whole different, like for your brain, that's a totally different thing. So it's like, how can you- horizontal, it wants to be right, vertical, yeah. like- <laughs> Right, so like, how can we, how can we find exercises that are gonna truly translate into what we're trying to do in the water? So that's, that, that's what jumped out at me right away. Like a squat, just a regular squat transitioning to the water, that's gonna be a tough sell. Right. Not that we don't do squats, but just it's gonna it's gonna be a little different approach. Katie, was there stuff when when Todd started working with you in that comeback to that that you were doing in 2016? Was there stuff that you were like, oh my gosh, why have I never done this before? You know, like uh, outside of the pool. Was there stuff that jumped out at you like that? Yeah, I mean, I think that the coolest part and the weirdest part at the same time is you know we would we would you know, work super hard in the, in the weight room, whether it was, you know, doing, you know, banded kettlebell swings or, you know, different plank variations. And I would be tired. Like, I mean, at that point I was 25, like I'd go to the pool and I'd be like, I'm really tired, but it wasn't the same, like heavy tired. Like I've done programs where I was just, I felt like I had a piano on my back and I was just this far underneath the water. And I, instead of feeling like, yes, I was tired because I had done these, you know, really explosive hard exercises, I felt more connected to the water. I felt like I could really feel certain, you know, po powerful parts of my stroke. Like, I think I dropped two seconds in my hundred breast stroke within six months of us working together, which like I was 25, like I had already been to two Olympics. Like I wasn't like on the up and up as an age grouper. And so um, that I think was the biggest thing for me is we were doing hard movements, but they were very much very so specific that I could like, for example, on a banded kettlebell swing, you know, I could feel how I needed to drive my hips into the breaststroke stroke. And that connected immediately for me. Um, and so I think, you know, the combination of making sure I was staying healthy, I was still recovering, I was gaining power. Like I was kind of astounded, you know, obviously we had our, our moments. He was my boyfriend at the time. <laughs> like you look stupid and uncoordinated. Don't embarrass me <laughs> in the gym moment. But for the most part, um, you know, I was just very, very impressed of kind of the combination of, you know, like he mentioned, like the movement prep, the neural prep, the power, the resistance, everything that he brought into it to kind of make this, you know, massive program that just made sense with what I was doing. And I was doing a lot of stuff in the pool yeah. too. So, yeah. It's been really fun for me too, because I didn't come into it like I know, you know, I know everything, no. you know, I was very, I'm, I'm still, you know, learning every day and very humble to one of the, some of these, you know, swim strength conditioning coaches have put together, but to have a, her perspective to kind of bounce ideas off of and some of her friends, you know, there's a pretty good <laughs> body of work that I can, sure. that I can yes. pull for different ideas. So it's been really fun for me. I remember I coached my wife in swimming for a dry, uh, for a triathlon once. And all she can remember that I said was, put your head down, put your head down. <laughs> She's staring forward like this. And See, Katie that, was, oh, sorry, go ahead. All, that is all I said, because she wouldn't put her head down. <laughs> You're like, if you put your head down, it'd be fine. Yeah, right. I'm not going to give you a second instruction of the first one. Um, so I can only imagine what it was like uh, being in a relationship and training someone for like the highest level of competition. Katie was so dialed in. She was great up until the point where she stopped swimming. And then I tried to give her workouts just for like general health and wellness. And then it just all. Yeah, I'm like, I don't see the value in this. Am like, I trying she, to be the best in the she world? Or? The, the, most co the most coachable to the least coachable overnight when she retired swimming. <laughs> I need value to anything I'm doing. Um, but yeah, no, I would actually get. why, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Wow. 
Yeah. <laughs> so, that was the end of that. <laughs> yeah, that was the end of that. But I think, yeah, I mean, if he told me we were doing three sets of 20 kettlebell swings and then you'd be like, hey, I maybe, you know, based on your form, we need to scale back. Like that would be a fight because like once you tell me the rep scheme, that's that's what I'm doing. I'm programmed. We're doing that. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it, and I think actually you paid Todd a really good compliment there in terms of, because one of the things I've always ran into in, in dry land programming, like for instance, uh, um, um, two jobs ago, I was an assistant coach at Georgia tech and, uh, you know, we had a strength and conditioning coach at that point on the team. Um, and, uh, we butted heads all the time. Like I can remember one time, uh, talking with her and I said, like, look, we've, we, we've got to scale back what we're doing because we have our mid season invitational. And she said, well, I mean, I actually had a, um, a max lift scheduled for a week afterwards. And I, I looked at her, I said, like, this is not a power lifting team. Yeah. <laughs> like, we're, we're, we're a swimming team. We're going to yeah. try to yeah. do well at the swimming competitions. Um, so I think that, you know, sometimes you can really get into conflict over, you know, this is important training. It's really valuable. It can do so many things for you, but swimming is a sport. Yeah. You know? In the end, yeah. you want to swim fast, right? Um, everything else is, is nice. It's like, uh, I, I tell, told people when I was out traveling around to teams, like, uh, you, as Katie references needing a why, um, you know, at some point in, in my, uh, personal workout career, I was only doing bicep curls because I knew that's what my wife, she, she liked, you know, she, she liked that beach muscle. Yeah. So that was my why. I was like, okay, <laughs> Aww, honey, I'll, uh, I'll get in and uh, put it up and down a little bit, you know? Yeah. Uh, I think I could do a little bit better than that, Todd. But again, we'll save that for the second conversation offline. Yeah. Um, all right. I want to finish up with you two. Um, I, I'm really glad I found out when you guys met each other because um, I want to ask each of you, I have uh, five rapid fire questions here uh, about the other person's athletic career. Um, oh, so we're going to have a little competition. Who oh, knows God. the other person better? And obviously, all your football numbers you, have, right now. you have way more stuff. But I'm trying to think of all your football <laughs> numbers. For sure, you're going to be like, what year? <laughs> All right. I threw a couple swimming softballs in there, Todd. I think. Okay, cool. Um, uh, who wants to go first? You go first. I'll go first. Okay. Todd, there's there's five questions, and the fifth one you can get bonus points on. And who knows if we'll even keep track of this. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what place did Katie finish in her first Olympic race at just 15 years old? First Olympic race. Where did I am? Sure I am. Okay. Seven. Seventeenth. Oh, God. He's thinking, but yeah. you got it. That was pretty that was good. Impressive the seven was the, the two hundred I am. Uh, you I'll, know what? I, I see that as a win. I'm gonna <laughs> count it. Todd. I'm gonna count it. That's it impressive. Yeah. I, I I can't I can't argue that. Uh, okay, here's your softball. What is the order of the individual medley? Okay. Uh, wait, hold on. <laughs> Uh, fly. Yep. Breast. No, oh so that, wait. Fly, fly back, breast free. I was thinking of the shirt. What shirt? You know, oh, my Speedo had that shirt that said, I get fly back, breast free. I was more. Yeah. It's like a half. I'll give you a half. Yeah, a half. All right. Half a point. One and a half points for Todd. <laughs> um, what stroke did Katie win the most international medals in? outside of the I am, like probably, other than I am. Probably freestyle. That's correct. Yes. Uh, what was Katie's lifetime best in the 400 I am? 432. 431. Wait, oh, <laughs> hey, who, uh, so that's close. What? Yeah. You're a second off, but it's close, it's close. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's close. 431.14. That's the old world record. That's, that's, the, not, that's the old world record. Is, is it right behind you? Yeah. That's the first. So I framed my first one. It says 432.89. And my, uh, that's what he sees all the time. All right, so that is all there. Right, that all is right. There. Gosh, we got we to gotta take it easy on Todd here. Um, yeah, no, we're being okay. mean. That's this, one, this last question is, is really mean, though. Um, although, based on this conversation, 
uh, that's too much of a hint. Anyway, in her breakthrough 2005 World Championships, Katie won a gold medal in the four by 200 relay. And I'll give you one point for each relay teammate you can name. Oh. Nelly Coughlin. Uh, Kayla Sandino. Uh, I don't know, Summer Sanders. No. <laughs> Summer Sanders? It's only wrong, one person wrong I day. <laughs> I watched a lot of Nickelodeon when I was a kid. <laughs> But great Summer Sanders shout out. Shout out to Summer Sanders. You were yeah. really incredible and we loved watching you. Um, we had Whitney Myers was the oh, third I would, one. I would never know that. Yeah. I don't even know who that is right now. Oh, right. So, so that's, that's uh, two. That was three points. Oh, for that. Three, three and a half. Sorry. Yeah, so, no. so he got the first question. We gave him the first question, yeah. half of the second one. Right. He got the two and a half and then didn't get the fourth one and then got um two teammates so that's two teammates so that's four and a half points. that was solid that was, that was solid. Good. I'll say. All right. yeah all right katie you're you're lightning round okay. um what three sports did todd play in high school baseball wrestling and football and hockey uh, no, no, no. also did okay well, I hockey in high school. play basketball Oh wow! Okay, well, good. You got you got three of them. Okay. Um, what position oh. did Todd begin his career at Michigan State playing? Oh, well, that's a good question. Defensive end. Todd. No. Oh really? I thought that was right. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's good because I actually started a linebacker. But is defensive end what you can look up on the internet? Defensive end was the first, it, at, after the first season they switched. Yeah. If I was you're like me, you spent a little bit of time reading Todd's um, Michigan yeah, State yeah. bio. You're gonna find that he played defensive end, but I guess yeah, it was that's like, first. So that should count as a point. That's a half, that's a half. All right, that's a half, that's a half. Um, what was the name? So we we're at one and a half here. What was the name of the award that Todd received his senior year at Michigan State. I, I don't think he's going to get this one. I feel like I've seen it in your parents' basement. Oh, yeah, it's definitely in there. I want to say Honda, but it's not. No. Um, is someone's name? Yeah. It is a name. I'll give you that. I got nothing. I've seen it a million times. And I know he got the award. I just don't know the name. Tommy Love Award. Oh, yep. Okay. All right. Actually, I made this much harder on, on Katie. <laughs> this is all the hints are around this room. <laughs> okay. What was Todd's time at the MSU Pro Day in the 40 yard dash? The hundreds? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you tens. Four eight. No. It was four nine? No, it's slower than that, I think. Five oh, five point oh six. He said he got four eight. That's a whole different thing. But... <laughs> This is a whole other conversation to be had about that. Okay. Um, finally, lose. Here's your here's your one where you can catch all the way up. Okay. okay. What was the name of the bowl game oh. that Michigan State won Todd's senior year? And Alpha. That's correct. Okay. For bonus points, who did they beat? <laughs> oh, you said it so many times. I can give you a hint. No, don't give me a hint. Don't give me a hint. I want to say, no, you got crushed by Alabama. That's one in a one bowl. Um, Iowa? I don't like that. You have, you have friends that swam there. Florida? <laughs> it's Georgia. It's Georgia, oh, Katie. It's pretty, and I would have been like, dogs. Oh. The dogs. Yeah. That's for fun. for extra super bonus points, you could have given their national ranking as found on Michigan State's. Uh, well, come on, he had to name your four by two hundred relay teammates, and you just—I didn't know you were going to bring them up. I wrote these questions ahead of time, you know. I didn't know you were going to bring up Caitlin and Natalie. I would have got Natalie for sure. 
Yeah. I mean, that was just like a go-to guess, like Natalie sums everything. So you were like, Natalie Coughlin just threw it out there. And All right, guys, I'm going to let you go. You guys got to be up early tomorrow morning. It was really a pleasure talking to you. Thanks for being willing to uh, do this with me. And uh, the book is called Blueprint. Yeah. The company is Synergy. Um, mm -hmm. And where can people go if they want to find more information about both? Yeah, so uh, for the book, um, they can go to just, it's just www.kthoff.com. Um, you can get a, a personalized copy, an autographed copy. Um, and then for Synergy, just www.synergydryland.com. Um, and our Instagram is at Synergy Dryland. We do a lot of different um, just exercise um, posts. And we actually have a really exciting um, it's called Synergy, uh, RPE by Synergy, uh, Rate of Perceived Excellence, uh, that is launching actually tomorrow. So that'll be. Wow. Well, we'll see if I can get the podcast up in time to, to <laughs> uh, meet your launch. All right. Um, thank you, guys. Thank you thank so much. You.